Tonight I suggest to you that the First Amendment adopted by the people as a shield to protect the dissemination of diverse viewpoints has become a sword, striking at values and institutions that define who we are as a nation. Would that I could tell you that the United States Supreme Court is responding forcefully to prevent such developments. To the contrary, a majority of the justices is championing these changes. I focus on three this evening. First, money and the rule of law. Citizens United Against Federal Election Commission, the court's blithely expansive opinion on corporate speech, has had consequences, in my view, antithetical to the very notion of participatory democracy. The old adage, money talks, has become our cardinal principle of governance. Members of this audience understand full well the corrosive effect of Citizens United on campaigns for legislative and executive offices. Less well understood and certainly far less reported in the media is the disastrous effect of that case on the judicial branch. Exhibit one, an earlier case, the Republican Party of Minnesota against White decided in 2002. Every state has a written code of judicial ethics <clears throat> to which its judges must adhere. At issue in White was a provision of the Minnesota Code of Judicial Ethics that prohibited candidates for judicial office from announcing their views on disputed legal or political issues. The Minnesota Judicial Ethics Rule, like all others, was designed to preserve both the appearance and the reality of judicial neutrality. The principle that judges must decide each case based only on the evidence and not on extraneous factors, such as allegiance to party platform or wealthy contributors, is central to the rule of law. Basic stuff, really. Except that judicial candidate White, with the backing from a powerful conservative think tank, claimed that the Minnesota announced rule violated his right of free speech, specifically his right to announce his positions on issues such as abortion and the death penalty, even though such issues were likely to come before him as a judge. Five of the justices of the Supreme Court sided with White. Justice Scalia, writing for the majority, brushed aside concerns about the effect of special issue campaigning on the quality of justice. Granted, he conceded, a party in a case who argues against a position previously announced by the judge is likely to lose. Those are Justice Scalia's words, likely to lose. But so long as all litigants taking that stand in the judge's court are also likely to lose, he reasoned, the judge is applying the law even-handedly. And there's no cause to complain. As long as the, as the judge announces, I am opposed to punitive damages, and as long as she holds to that position in every single case and never provides for punitive damages, there's no reason to complain. Is this, Justice Scalia, what we as a society mean by the rule of law? I think not. White was just the beginning. Several federal courts have relied on White's First Amendment analysis to strike down other judicial ethics rules, for example, ones that prohibit judicial candidates from promising in advance to decide certain cases a certain way. I will never allow punitive damages in any case, promises the judge, and she does not, no matter the facts of a particular case or the law. And this term, the Supreme Court will consider whether judicial candidates have a First Amendment right to solicit campaign contributions directly from lawyers who appear before them. I leave it to you to anticipate the outcome of that case. Hardcore activists determined to go state by state to dismantle all ethical restrictions on what judicial candidates may say, even while on the bench, fund most of the First Amendment litigation, pitting the rule of law against judicial campaign speech. Their goal has nothing to do with enhancing the marketplace of ideas or enriching public discourse. Their goal is to buy the loyalty 
of judges who will then rule in favor of the group's special interests. By pounding judges or judicial candidates seen as adverse to their interests with negative uh, advertising, much of it of the gutter variety, these groups eschew all subtlety about their aim. It is to buy the loyalty of judges who will rule in their favor. And the strategy is working for there's growing evidence that these, quote, free from all ethical restraint campaigns do in fact affect the outcome of cases. And the worst part of this, I quote, the crisis of confidence in the impartiality of the judiciary is real and growing, left unaddressed, the perception that justice is for sale will undermine the rule of law that courts are supposed to uphold. These are the words of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who has been sounding the alarm across this country. In South Africa, I watched as the rule of law was perverted to maintain the power of the powerful. As a young law student at Yale, I found here a society striving for justice, a society where law was a force for democracy. It opened school doors for black children. It helped secure the right to vote for every citizen. It gave women control over our bodies. And the perversion of the rule of law is to maintain the power of the powerful. I am concerned about such beginnings here. And left unaddressed, the prediction of Justice O'Connor's may be our reality. <laughs>